but welcome to the Home and Community Based Services 101 under Cal AIM. I will be one of your presenters today. My name is Erin. I've I'm a staff attorney at Disability Rights Education Defense Fund. I've been here for almost a year now. Uh, my background is uh, predominantly in housing, um, particularly tenant rights, representing tenants and representing unhoused people. Um, and I'll pass it over to Sylvia to introduce herself. Thank you, Erin. My name is Sylvia Yi. I'm a senior staff attorney with Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. Um, I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I have um, short, dark hair. I wear glasses. I have tasteful earrings, and my background is blurred. Um, I think I'm going to, that, that's, that's about it. That's all you need to know. I'm going to hand you back to Erin. Thanks. And um, I forgot my own description. I am uh, wearing a red plaid shirt. I have a blurred background and um, I have short, dark hair as well. Sylvia and I actually look quite alike. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, the uh, training today um, is focusing on uh, housing services for people, uh, predominantly people with disabilities, people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, um, and different uh, programs and services are available through Medi-Cal and through the new initiatives under Cal-AIM um, to keep people in their homes um, and to help people with supportive services. So there is a lot um, that falls under this category. Uh, so it's very much too much to go over in an hour. So we're choosing a few things to focus on. Um, and then we'll be sending the slides out afterward. And just to note that um, as part of the presentation under the note section, which isn't part of the slide, but um, is the notes attached to the slide, uh, there'll be additional links and resources on there where you can get more detailed information beyond what's presented in the slide and what will be presented in the um, present in the training. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. Um, so before we dive into some of the newer initiatives um, under Cal AIM, there are already some pre-existing uh, programs and some pilot programs under Medi-Cal. Um, and then later in the presentation, we're going to go through the housing community-based service waivers that can be used as well. Um, so one pilot program that Medi-Cal had previously was the, or, or still has, is a health homes program. Um, so this is a program that is benefiting people uh, who are at risk of homelessness, who have chronic uh, health conditions, and particularly um, multiple uh, health conditions um, and people who have experienced inpatient services, hospitalizations, or institutionalization. Um, and the Health Homes Program uh, provides certain services to people. Uh, so this includes like a health action plan, um, coordination between different providers for the clients, uh, different training services to help with self-management and self-care to enable a person to live independently, um, as well as transitional services um, for people leaving a nursing home or an institution. Uh, there's also services in how to, in educating people about healthy living um, and healthy behaviors. And it's also a program that helps connect people with um, other services and provide referrals and stuff like that. Um, and Medi-Cal is funded through state and federal funding. Um, and under a lot of the new initiatives that we're going through, it helps with different housing uh, initiatives. Um, however, federal money uh, under Medicaid cannot be used for housing um, under Medi-Cal, but certain state funding can. Um, and if you could go on to the next slide. So, um, this is the, so now we're going to do an overview of more the newer resources under Cal AIM for housing and community support. Um, so this was, uh, released in January 1st of 2022. Um, so these are programs that have been available for about the last two years. 
Um, and this, the, the purpose of the housing community support is to keep people in the least restrictive environment possible. Uh, people who are Medi-Cal beneficiaries to have an alternative to institutionalization, um, to nursing homes, and to help keep people in the community. Uh, the way it works is if you are under the managed care plan, the managed care plan can choose one of the listed services here. Um, these are pre-approved services that can be a substitute for other services that a client could have. Um, now, it's sort of up to the managed care plans to choose these services. They don't necessarily have to. Um, and I'm sure some of you are asking, well, where, who has of the managed care plans have chosen these services? Um, so I'm going to put in the chat um, a link from a report that came out recently in August. And this shows the different counties and health plans that have chosen to adopt some, some or all of these services. So you can, um, you know, it wouldn't make sense to go through it here, but you can check out the link um, to, um, sorry, you can check out the link to see the different counties and stuff. Um, and just another link I'm going to provide is to this report that just came out in August that has additional information. I think, is Tina already putting those links out? Um, sorry. Um, so that has, uh, so you can see what counties are providing these services and get additional information to see uh, um, how these services are have been panning out over the last two years in more detail. Um, since it's been released, there has been over 36,000 people who have been able to take advantage of these services. Um, so we can't go into detail on each one, but just as a quick overview, um, uh, a lot of the services provided is finding housing. Um, Calium can't actually like give you the housing because they don't own housing, but they can help with referrals and services to transition people into housing. They can help with certain monetary things like providing housing deposits, um, moving costs and expenses. Um, they, they cannot help provide rent on a monthly basis, unfortunately, um, but certain one-time payments uh, are available through this program. Um, programs to support and maintain uh, safe and stable housing that can include um, housing inspections and managing relationships with landlords and management companies. We'll go into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, there's a program for recuperative care. Um, so this is for short-term residential care for those who don't have housing to be able to recuperate after an illness or an injury um, when they're no longer able to be in the hospital. And then there's also short-term post-hospitalization housing. Um, this is similar, but it's a recovery place after institutional care um, for medical and behavioral issues. Uh, there are also respite services, day habilitation, um, which we'll go into a little bit more detail in a minute, and support to transition to housing from institutionalization, incarceration, uh, hospitalization, also support for sobering centers and for being provided medically supportive food. Um, and, and I go to, oh, one other link I want to share um, that this is the policy guide, and um, this will also be included in. Um, this will also be included in the PowerPoint that we send out too, uh, but wanted to make sure people have the links um, before we send out the PowerPoint. But this next one goes into all these programs I just listed in more detail, including the eligibility for each program, because each program has a different eligibility that we'll go over briefly. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to go into a little bit more detail on the housing transition navigation services. 
Um, so this, this provides a wide range of services uh, for people, predominantly people who are either unhoused, formerly unhoused, at risk of being unhoused, or um, in a, 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 a housing situation that's not stable, particularly for people who have serious disabilities, serious mental health issues, and people who were formerly incarcerated. Among the services that this program provides includes tenant screening and assessments. So this is looking at um, what are some of the barriers to obtaining housing and helping people overcome those barriers. Um, so this inclu can include um, helping people with the application process, gathering documents for applying for rental housing, um, helping out with security deposits. Uh, as part of the program, you create an individualized housing support plan, which creates short and long-term goals um, for the client to keep and maintain um, housing. The program also helps with housing searches. Um, this could be looking for housing um, that is low income housing, permanent supportive housing, um, and different types of housing that will meet that person's needs. And a lot of that is through sort of referrals and connecting with different agencies. Um, helping out with housing expenses. So this could include uh, moving. This also includes adaptive aids. This also includes any reasonable modifications needed to the apartment to help um, provide money for that. So if you uh, need a ramp, if you need bars in the shower, providing the money um, as a one-time expense to cover reasonable modifications for people with disabilities. Um, it also helps on uh, with certain financial needs, such as doing benefits advoca advocacy for receiving SSI, um, helping people go through the process to obtain a rental subsidy or other uh, financial coverage for rental expenses. Um, I think one important thing to keep in mind is with these services, a lot, a lot of it is connecting people to services, making people aware of the services and helping them go through the application or process, but doesn't necessarily guarantee that they will receive the services. Um, for instance, with uh, Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher, uh, there is a long waiting list for that. So although um, the service can help someone navigate getting on that waiting list, providing recertification materials, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would get a Section 8 voucher. Um, the, the program also helps with creating a housing crisis plan. Uh, the purpose of the housing crisis plan is to also ensure people maintain their housing by identifying issues that might uh, cause them to lose their housing and put in preventative me measures or intervening. Um, the program also helps with reasonable accommodation requests you might need to make to your landlord. Um, such as maybe changing the date that you pay rent to coincide with SSI payments or other rental subsidy payments. Um, it also helps with communicating with the landlord um, and, or management company or, or whoever is the person in charge of the housing uh, to maintain a healthy communication between both parties. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind with this is that, um, you know, in my experience, having done uh, housing law for like six years and interacting with a lot of landlords, um, uh, a lot of landlords might not want to engage in this process and they're not, might feel like, you know, they're not technically legally required to. Um, however, because this program is meant to benefit people with disabilities, um, one way to get around a unresponsive landlord would be to ask for a reasonable accommodation request for their disability to engage with um, 
with the case worker or case manager who is helping the client with the housing transition navigation services. So if the landlord is refusing to participate in the engagement services and communication services provided, um, you can request a reasonable accommodation. If they refuse to do that, you know, that is potentially um, a violation of uh, FIHA and other regulations protecting people with disabilities in housing. Um, and then this program, similarly to others, is also focused on people who are unhoused, at risk of being unhoused, formerly incarcerated, and people with serious disabilities and mental health issues. Um, and then the another thing that they do is inspecting to ensure that it's actually a healthy, um, safe environment for people to live in. Um, and then the last thing is that although they will, this program will help with some one-time uh, monetary payments like deposits and uh, reasonable modifications, they they cannot help pay rent on a regular basis. Uh, if you can move to the next slide. So day habilitation programs. Um, this program is meant to help people who um, help people providing services within the home. So if you if a, the person has a home, then a peer mentor can come and help them learn different life skills. If the person doesn't have a home, um, there can be like a physical location created by the peer mentor or other um, worker at the program to set up a place for someone to go if they are, un are unhoused, for example. Um, but the sort of the point of the day habilitation program is to provide services um, and skills building for people who are not um, in an institution or a facility. Um, so the peer mentoring is meant to help with social skills um, so that a person can sort of function independently in their environment. Um, so again, this could include communicating with landlord, neighbors, managers of the building. Um, it also helps with uh, skills to live a more independent life, understanding how to use public transportation, um, building skills and conflict resolution with people, learning how to manage interpersonal relationships and function in the community. Um, it also provides specific services that people might need to live in the home. So this could be um, understanding how to obtain a roommate and how to interact with that roommate, how to get furniture how to and other furnishings for your home, and how to ma manage finances for the home. Um, it also has uh, services to have people understand communicating with the community and available community services, like how to contact a fire station, police department, um, ambulance. Um, and also sort of living within the home. So understanding how to cook, how to clean, how to do laundry, how to manage your money within the home. Um, a, a lot of it is also centered around uh, self-advocacy, understanding your rights, understanding your rights as a tenant, understanding your rights as a citizen, and being able to advocate for yourself. Um, it, it also comes with benefits, advocacy, similar to the transition navigation services. Um, and, th and this program can be administered to individuals or to like a group, depending on the situation. Um, and this is specifically for people who were, who've been unhoused in the last 24 months, um, or who have been housed in the last 24 months, but was unhoused before that. So new to being housed, um, to help them maintain that housing, as well as people who are at risk of being unhoused, people who are currently unhoused, and people who are in other unstable living situations. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, can you go back one for the eligibility? No, sorry, the <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Yeah. Oh, back one. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I said eligibility earlier, but it's the one before that. The housing, tenancy, and support services. Yes, right there. Um, thank you. So, um, the housing, tenancy, housing, tenancy, and sustaining services. Um, so this is sort of somewhere to the other programs, um, but focusing a little bit more on the interactions a tenant might have with a landlord. So um, one is um, providing some sort of like intervention plan or services when a person might be at risk of losing their housing. Um, so this could be if someone's violating their lease, if someone's behind on rent, if someone's hoarding, um, and other behaviors like that. Um, it, it involves educating uh, the person of their rights as a tenant um, and also educating the landlord um, and coaching to maintain relationships between the landlord and the tenants. Um, I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind if you have a client who is using these services um, is that you don't want to make a landlord aware of the things that your tenant is doing, the, ten, the things that a tenant is doing wrong um, in a rental unit. Um, if you have a client who is hoarding and their landlord doesn't know it, you don't want to inform their landlord and engage in these services of communicating with the landlord because um, the eviction process uh, in California is very quick and is probably quicker than these services would provide for managing the relationships between the two parties. Um, for example, if someone is hoarding, um, uh, a landlord could give them just three days to fix the hoarding before starting an unlawful detainer to evict them. Of course, in that situation, what you would want to do is request a reasonable accommodation for more time to uh, fix the hoarding issue. But if the landlord is not aware of the issue, um, the best thing to do in that situation is try to help your client out um, without making the landlord aware, because that could make them at risk of being evicted. Of course, if the landlord is already aware of it, maybe that's how the tenant became engaged with these services or became engaged with you as an attorney, um, you would want to try to implement these services and might want to ask for a reasonable accommodation to enable these services to play out before an eviction occurs since these services are meant to help people with disabilities. Um, so uh, in addition to that, um, a lot of uh, dispute conflict resolution with landlords and with neighbors um, because disputes with neighbors can also lead to an eviction um, if it's considered to be a nuisance or that neighbor is complaining a lot to uh, the landlord. Um, certain eviction prevention, so this is mostly connecting people with services um, like eviction defense lawyers um, and other services to help prevent eviction. Um, Again, benefits advocacy help with recertification. So if someone has a, a subsidy, a voucher, they generally need to recertify every year. If someone is in a low income housing tax credit, they might have to recertify their income uh, once a year or on a regular basis. So that process can be kind of complicated. Um, so these services help to help tenants to navigate that, obtaining the financial documents that are needed, making sure that information is submitted in on time, um, and health and safety visits. So making sure that the home is uh, you know, free of mold is actually a healthy place to live, and providing different um, independent living services similar to the day habilitation program. Um, so the way this program works um, is that it is only provided once during a person's use of this program, the duration of which can last a long time, but it's only provided once. Um, and then if once it's considered not uh, effective anymore or no longer needed, the program ends and a person cannot 
take advantage of the program again um, unless they're able to show some sort of change in circumstances that would show that this program would be effective where it wasn't effective before. Um, and that is a little bit different from the um, the other programs that we went over earlier where you can engage in the program more than once but the housing and tenancy sustaining services you can only engage with once um and this is for people who are formerly incarcerated who've been institutionalized or have a chronic disability or are at risk of being unhoused um and the, the last thing I'll sort of add about these services um, is that I think that with all the services, one should really um, take into consideration incorporating uh, other aspects of the, of the law to ensure that your client can engage with these services, like asking for a reasonable accommodation under FIHA, being aware of disability discrimination under FIHA and under the ADA, um, because the way some of these program, the way this program sort of set up is it sort of assumes um, that the tenant is the one that needs the intervention and need the, these behavioral management and that the landlord just needs sort of education. Um, but in, in my own experience, you know, a landlord, um, I always say like a landlord, unlike a public interest lawyer or a nurse, they're not there to provide a service for people. They're there to make money. Um, and so they're not always going to have the best interests of the tenant in mind. Um, so use sort of every tool at your disposal to make sure that your client is able to take advantage of these um, programs. Um, and next slide, please. Um, so I kind of went over this uh, with each program, but um, each program under the housing community supports for Cal AIM have different eligibility requirements. So in the last link I sent under each program, it says what the eligibility is. So um, you can check that out to see if your client fits into that. But in general, these programs are meant for um, people who are either unhoused or at risk of being unhoused. And the definition for that is the same definition used for HUD. Um, people with serious mental illness, people with serious chronic conditions, and people are at risk of institutionalization. Um, and it's a program that children can also take advantage of if they're at risk of being unhoused or part of the transition age youth. Um, who have other barriers to housing. And uh, next slide. So these are the HCBS waivers and Sylvia will be taking over. As soon as Sylvia figures out how to unmute herself there. Thank you, Erin. That was really helpful. And um, I would really appreciate your uh, you bringing your um, housing and tenancy experience to uh, the application of these uh, HCPS waivers and especially these new services. So with the HCPS waivers, I'm, I'm going to provide a little bit of framing, a little bit of background on, on waivers. I mean, California is moving to a place and pretty well has succeeded in placing virtually all of the state's Medi-Cal population under Medicaid managed care. That's basically how people get Medi-Cal now, they, um, they get it through a plan. Uh, there are still, however, waivers offered to specific populations, geographic areas for specific purposes. And these are administered by the Department of Healthcare Services, the, the state, not, not the plans. These are, these home and community-based services are administered by the Department of Healthcare Services, who is the Medicaid agent, the single Medicaid agent, agency for California. Waivers are named that way, and I know some of you are very well aware of this, and, and some of you may not be. Um, waivers are named this way because they allow states to waive the normal Medicaid requirements. Under the Medicaid Act, uh, there are rules set out for the joint federal-state program, and they're established by the federal government. 
basically, if you want to take Medicaid money, follow the rules. And a few provisions in the rules allow the states to waive some of the normal rules and create programs that are, that are intended for only some Medi-Cal beneficiaries for specific purposes. These special programs are also in turn and rather confusingly called waivers. So Aaron went over some of these new services that are available in a very big waiver, the, the California um, CalAIM waiver that is intended to transform overall service delivery in the entire California Medicaid program. Um, and it's trying to push towards a better recognition of social determinants of health and especially critical housing needs. There has been evidence for a while now that housing is, is really a linchpin of health and housing has more to do um, with uh, of avoiding unnecessary emergency visits than a lot of other programs like enhanced case management, for example. So that's why it's it's so linked together. It's it's so personal. Um, though as well, obviously, things like enhanced case management and in lieu of services are really important too. And just to note, ILO services, the in lieu of services and the and the Cal AIM services are available. They're potentially available to any Medi-Cal beneficiary. But it in in practice it's generally recognize that a, a clear minority of Medi-Cal beneficiaries will actually need those services. Those who have more complex care conditions, um, dis people with disabilities, uh, so, some older people, and especially those who are um, unhoused and in need of housing. So I'm I'm going to go over just a few of the um, the the more traditional waiver programs, not not CalAIM, that are still around, even as the big overall changes move forward. These are programs designed specifically for Medi-Cal beneficiaries who have significant level of care needs, as in an institutional or nursing home level of care. And they're intended to allow these individuals to remain in the community. For the most part, these are uh, waivers that are authorized under Section 1915C, and they're sometimes called 1915C waivers. And they're named as such because Section 1915C is a section of the Medicaid Act that authorizes their existence. Each one has its own application and application timeline. And we have them listed on here. There's the Assisted Living Waiver, the Home and Community-Based Alternatives Waiver, HCBA, uh, home and Community-Based Services Waiver for the Developmentally Disabled, the Multipurpose Senior Services Waiver, and the Medi-Cal Waiver, Medi Waiver Program. And that last one used to be known as the AIDS Waiver. Uh, excuse me if once in a while I cough. I'm just getting over something. All right, so moving on to the... Uh, first one here we have here, the next slide, the assisted living waiver. The assisted living, it it envisual, envisions the assisted living uh, setting as an alternative, a more community-based alternative than an actual institutionalization or placement in a nursing facility. And the, the assisted living waiver is actually set to expire on February 29th, 2024. And yes, 2024 is a leap year. Um, the Department of Healthcare Services does intend to renew this waiver for another five-year term beginning on March 1st, 2024. And actually the public comment period uh, for that renewed waiver application just ended on October 5th. Um, there is an assisted living waiver fact sheet, which we should include with the slides. Um, this waiver facilitates the transition of members who are already uh, in an institution, institution, institution to a less restrictive setting, an assisted living setting, and also is meant to help prevent institutionalization in a nursing facility. These are people who have, uh, this is intended for beneficiaries who have care needs equal to those of Medi-Cal funded residents who are already living and receiving care in nursing facilities. Um, but they are willing and able to live in an assisted living facility or publicly subsidized housing as an alternative 
to the nursing facility. Uh, eligibility requires someone to be age 21 or older and receive full scope Medi-Cal eligibility um, with no share of cost. So these are people that are considered able and willing to reside safely in an assisted living facility or, or publicly subsidized housing. So by, by um, a community, uh, by an assisted living facility, we're thinking of something like a, a community, a required home-like setting. Um, it could be a residential care facility for the elderly, an RCFE, uh, an adult residential care facility, an ARF, or subsidized public housing uh, using um, assisted living uh, facilities. And it, the intent is to offer eligible seniors and persons with disabilities uh, this other option, a, a more community-based option, one where they can actually get out and be in the community using uh, and visit and see their families and friends more often. So I'll move on to the next slide. This is the, the Home and Community Based Alternatives Waiver, the HCBA waiver. And it is one that is needed and used very often by uh, uh, people with significant disabilities who would qualify for the, the, the medical and personal care assistance needs, that level of need that is provided in a nursing home, in a, in a nursing home. So care management services, to persons at risk for nursing home or institutional care. And it this is the waiver that provides um, um, an, enough hours of care uh, and enough uh, uh, services and enough intensity that will allow uh, people, adults and, and children with significant disabilities to actually stay safely in their home. The eligibility covers any age you do have to be Medi-Cal eligible. And I say Medi-Cal eligible because um, it does cover, let's say, children with really significant healthcare needs, premature children, children with um, very specific conditions uh, who need really almost like round the clock kind of um, uh, healthcare, health with health, those high levels of healthcare, healthcare needs. So even if their parents would normally not qualify for Medi-Cal, they make too much to qualify for Medi-Cal, it's possible to get services because there is a, a child with these really significant healthcare needs. Um, it will, uh, this, the HCBA waiver will cover those who are already living in a hospital or a nursing facility, or those who are at risk of institutionalization within 30 days. So institutionalization has to be quite imminent potentially. The big thing about this waiver is that it hit a waiting list as of July 12th, 2023. And so that means that um, in July of last year, it hit that close to 2000 limit. Uh, I think it was 8,974. And then anyone else who applied after that was put on a waiting list. And that's one of the conditions of that's waived in a waiver. Medi-Cal in general, Medi-Cal is just Medicaid in California, is a, um, oh, the phrase, the, the phrase when you are an entitlement program, which means that typically if you qualify for it, you are eligible, you apply, the, you, you get the services. You, you can't be just made to wait typically because the money has run out, say. With a waiver, with a waiver program like the HCBA waiver, the state potentially can place a, a cap on it. Uh, and it has done so with this program. And what's, what's, what's difficult is that there is an institutional bias in the Medicaid program. Um, institutional care is required. It's covered by Medicaid. Nursing home care is covered by Medicaid as a matter of federal law, and it's in California's state plan. But home and community-based services are optional in the plan and under federal law. So that means that um, 
there is this waiting list and our colleagues at Disability Rights California have called for 50,000 slots in the state with the ability to add more if needed. They believe very strongly that shorting the program will result in unnecessary institutionalization of thousands of Californians. And that is in, um, that is in, in violation of uh, the 1999 Supreme Court case of Olmstead um, and in what we would regard as the civil rights of people with disabilities to live in the community and in, a, in a, the most integrated environment. So there's a big difference between a call for 50,000 slots and the currently existing cap of just under 9,000. We will, we will note that for this, as for all the waivers, there is a need for um, cost neutrality. That is, uh, someone who uh, is living in the community cannot cost Medicaid more than if that person were living in a nursing home. I mean, in general, the average cost of someone living with an HCBA waiver in the community is less than 48,000 annually overall. And you can compare that with close to 129,000 annually for the same kinds of patients, the same kinds of care needs who are living in a skilled nursing facility. And these are according to estimates from the California Department of Healthcare Services. Um, when the state sought approval for the, for the program, it said participation would be capped at just under 9,000 people. Um, and that it would be over the next two years adding increases uh, over the next three years, adding increases to reach 12,300. I think it was six years ago is the last time that the HCBA waiver hit the cap. And um, some the department and some advocates think that the fact of COVID, the reality of COVID and the pandemic and the many deaths that took place in institutions has opt a has upped the desire for a waiver, something that allows uh, people with significant disabilities to live in the community rather than in an institution. Okay, so I will go on to the next waiver and the next slide. We also have um, a home and community-based services waiver for the developmentally disabled, and that allows persons with developmental disabilities to live at home or in the community rather than residing in a licensed health facility. Uh, eligibility uh, requires the, the person or, or the family member to have a formal diagnosis of intellectual disability or developmental disability and requires the person to be a regional center consumer. Uh, the level of care need uh, is that required of someone who is in a licensed healthcare facility for people with an intellectual disability. And um, the person has full scope, full scope medical eligibility. And here again is that sort of institutional deeming for those who are under 18. Um, institutional deeming is a special medical eligibility rule that considers only the, the personal income and resources of a person under the age of 18 or a married adult who is otherwise eligible for the waiver. And doing so means that you can um, you can not think of you cannot take into account the the income of parents or of a spouse's income or resources. And that's because there's such a huge gap, a huge gap between the amount that um, amount that is needed for personal care assistance and the services that one needs to live in the community when you have a significant disability and and the amount that that people make uh, for, for a living there's there's this big there's this big gap and if you don't you can not qualify for medicaid not qualify for medical and yet have nowhere near the amount of money you need to take care of the services you need um as a person with significant disabilities to live in the community. So institutional deeming is very helpful to allow uh, a child under 18 um, to, to remain in the community and to be eligible for medical services. Uh, and just a, a small note to be looking at, 
personal care assistants um, are very, very important to the lives of people with disabilities. Most personal care assistants um, in California, as in elsewhere, are women, people of color, often older. Um, these are individuals who deserve a living wage. And part of that living wage for someone who has a lot of personal care assistance needs means that personal care assistance will be very expensive. And it's a well-earned wage uh, and it needs to be it needs to be a living wage so that uh, people will be attracted to the positions who fill the who fill the jobs well. Um, but it does also mean that paying fully out of pocket for personal care assistance is almost impossible unless one is very wealthy. So on uh, June 23rd, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services approved the renewal of the HCBS DD waiver um, and actually has a retroactive start date of January 1st, 2023. Going on to the next slide. And just also noting that for the DD waiver, uh, California has uh, a, one of the largest DD waivers in the in the country, if not the largest. Um, uh, one of the last two we'll be looking at the multi-purpose senior services waiver. Um, it's an alternative to nursing care, an, a nursing care facility for those with a nursing home level of care. Again, like like the others, or, or most of the others. It provides a, a series of services and you have to be 65 and older to be eligible, uh, Medi-Cal eligible, and you have to live in or be willing to move to one of the counties where the waiver is available. So it's not necessarily a waiver that is available in every, like throughout California. Um, this is an important one because there are seniors, there are seniors who may now not actually want uh, the obligation and the work of fully managing their, their own services, um, and especially seniors who have acquired a disability for the very first time as an older person. This waiver is actually managed by the California Department of Aging, though the individual has to be a fully qualified Medi-Cal beneficiary. The MSSP waiver provides both social and healthcare management services to assist individuals to remain in their own homes and communities. Uh, that's something else to note about these waivers. Um, traditionally, they have, as Aaron has said, Medicaid doesn't cover housing. That's been a long time policy. Uh, and these are not waivers that will necessarily, these waivers, these traditional waivers are not necessarily things that will help with housing, um, though though they can buy um providing services in the home, help someone remain in, in a home they already have. They can help someone to, to age in place, for example. Um, MSSP provides ongoing care coordination, which as I indicated, can be very important to, to seniors who are just uh, not able, don't want to, um, to coordinate all this level of services that they need now. Um, and a lot of people who have MSSP also do have IHSS. It's not meant to uh, replace one or the other. Um, cost neutrality is, of course, the total annual combined cost of care management and other services must be lower than the cost of receiving care in a skilled nursing facility. And uh, a team of health and social service professionals provides each MSSP participant with a complete health and psychosocial assessment to determine needed services. Um, and you can see some of the services that are available, the case management as indicated, personal care services and adult day care, uh, respite care, which can be very important when a spouse is taking care of a, a senior who has dementia, for example, um, transportation, personal emergency response systems, a, a list of services, and uh, that can be uh, very important to, to um, seniors as well. And then I'm just going to move quickly on to this last one, uh, the Medi-Cal waiver program, which was formerly known as the AIDS waiver. It provides case management and direct care services uh, to persons living with HIV uh, or AIDS um, as an alternative to nursing facility care or hospitalization. Again, you can see this, this push towards allowing people to live in the community where their support networks are, where their family is, where their friends are. 
living at home instead of an institution. Eligibility requires um, Medi-Cal recipients who are eligible for a nursing facility level of care um, uh, or hospitalization and that have the, the aid code with full benefits. And codes are some uh, codes are a way that Medicaid um, assigns and recognizes Medi-Cal beneficiaries. Uh, these are also indi individuals who are not involved or not enrolled in the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly. That's a separate program, um, not. So HIV or AIDS with related, individuals have to have HIV or AIDS with related signs or symptoms or disabilities. Um, and children under 13 years with HIV, AIDS, or symptoms uh, also qualify. Um, and uh, it, it provides uh, individuals with a home setting that is intended to be safe for both the client and service providers. Uh, this approval has also been um, approved uh, for a five-year period with a retroactive start date of January 1st, 2023. Um, the, the California's application for this waiver was approved on February 16th, and it went back a little bit, a couple of months. Um, okay, and just a, a, my final note for all the waivers is that across all of these waivers, or most of these waivers, DHC has pretty, pretty recently received approval for a waiver amendment that adds telehealth as a permanent service delivery option. Um, so telehealth originally was approved as a, it was an emergency waiver service under, under the pandemic. So with this approval from um, the feds, from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, at least some services for all the waivers um, have been approved permanently. And for this waiver, for the um, the Medi-Cal waiver program waiver, uh, psychotherapy, case management, and nutritional counseling have been made permanently available through telehealth. So uh, to just get it quickly at the end here, the Medi-Cal hearings, um, how it's this is basically how one appeals the the denial of a Medi-Cal service or the uh, stopping of a medical service, and even um, denial of eligibility actually is a, is a possibility. So with the services that Aaron has covered, the, in lieu of services, the, the, the new housing related services under CalAIM, um, enhanced case management services, those are all obtained through a plan. And so the b first step it, with a denial of those services is to file a formal complaint or grievance with your plan. And you are supposed to get a response in 30 days or in three days if it's a very urgent need. This, uh, once you have that, you can you can go to a Medi-Cal fair hearing, a state fair hearing. So it's a that's a county or a Department of Healthcare Services covered California eligibility. You you have to file the request within 90 days of receiving the, the notice of action um, uh, or the good cause. Um, and uh, so a notice of action is a written notice that gives Medi-Cal applicants and beneficiaries an explanation of their eligibility for medical coverage or benefits. And the notice of action should include the eligibility decision the effective date of coverage, as well as any changes made in your eligibility status or level of benefits. The notice of action must include information about your hearing rights and how to appeal the decision if you disagree with the eligibility determination. It's also possible, uh, California is somewhat unique amongst the states in having a department of uh, managed health care. And they have, don't think I have this as, just sorry. Oh, right. That's in the next page. So I'm I'm just going to um, to go to that next slide, actually, uh, quickly to look at the um, Medi-Cal hearings because uh, no, not Medi-Cal hearings. I'm sorry, the um, the independent medical review and complaint process, because that's what's made available under the Department of Managed Healthcare Services. That's one thing when you are getting services through a plan. You can also go on to an 
you can also ask for an independent medical review and, and a complaint process through DMHC. So when your health plan denies or changes or delays your request for medical services, or denies a payment for emergency treatment, or refuses to cover experimental and, or investigation, investigational treatment for a serious medical condition, you can file that grievance. Um, and then if you're denied, you can file a complaint uh, with DMHC. And they also have this emergency as this expedited independent medical review process. And that's a really important one to note. If, if you have um, a very limited amount of time to try to get a, a service that you feel is very important, very necessary, very, very, very important for your client. And you're looking at um, in imminent action, imminent fear of, 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 of institutionalization, of, of losing the housing, of not getting needed housing. Um, I, IMR might be a possibility. I, I kind of doubt it because it's usually confined to medical review, and it's interesting to see how this how this process is going to work together. Um, I suspect that most of the ECM and in lieu of services will be funneled through the complaint process, um, but I don't think all of that is fully determined yet. And I would love to hear from any of you what you're seeing on the ground. And when it comes right down to it, all of these services can be a fantastic help. They're intended to be a fantastic help, but it depends so much on plans recognizing where the need is, saying yes and not gatekeeping, and on advocates knowing when to push for them. Um, and that's that's a that's a hefty process. That's a lot to be done to to try to get. To that point where these services become real for people who are on the ground. Um, so I'm actually going to end it there, which leaves us only a couple of minutes for questions. But there might be there might be one that we can address. This is Tina. There's one question in the chat from Laudis. Can you define institutionalized as how much time and how far back? Um, institutionalized as in um, like how how long someone has been in in institutionalization in in institution in a nursing facility, let's say. I think i'm I'm going to look at it that way. and I it doesn't um I don't think there's really a a time limit for that. i if if you're living if you've been, if your client is in a nursing home and wants to leave and they're saying, you know, they won't let her leave, that's enough. Even if she's only been there for one week or two days. So the only thing is if she's in there on a status that is temporary to begin with, um, that is, you know, you're in the nursing facility um, and uh, it's for two weeks. But I guess the fear is always that even then, even then, if the the thought is that she's this the client may potentially be losing their housing um, or no one's paying the rent, uh, all of that. I mean, that is that is part of of institutionalization and being at risk of institutionalization. Um, if I'm not answering the question, or if there's something I'm missing, I'm happy to to also be in touch with you after too. If you want to send me your um, email. Is there anything else from anyone who has? We are very close to the end of time. Or Aaron or myself. We can also unmute people too, if someone wants to ask a question verbally. Um, they can be a hand raise if you want that. Um, I see oh. Judith is oh. raising their hand. I will allow Judith to unmute. 
Thank you. Um, I just had a question about some of the um, effective dates you were mentioning, because it sounds like a lot of them were retroactive. Mm, yes, for some of the uh, some of the waivers. Is that what? Yeah. Oh, OK. For some of the waivers. So the June 23rd approval that became retroactive when? I think it went to earlier in 2023. Let me uh, it wasn't one of the slides and I'm just going to look for that. Um, yeah. It, oh, it yeah. Was. As far as I know, there are not there's no, there are not any holes in these waivers, the ones that we've covered here. There's no um, uh, none. And, and they do. Yeah. I mean, they get in there. They know the date is coming up. They prepare. Mm -hmm. And they're, it, it, we are talking about pages and pages and pages of application. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> so I, I guess that's why. And then and then you we don't the state doesn't necessarily have full control of how long CMS takes to review something. So I guess that's that's actually sort of what happens. But I I I mean these waves with these the waivers we've covered here. I don't think we're really looking at um, and it's not a huge risk of sort of an outright denial. I'll I'll say of these, it's not really going to be like no, you can't have the AIDS waiver anymore. Ah, uh. that's not in general how how it will work for these waivers. I think the the biggest big change here was the whole big Cal AM waiver with, you know, and that was approved in 2022. Oh, okay. So there was one for 2022. Yeah. And, and for this, you know, for a number of years coming up um, and they're sort of rolling out these services, like the, the ones that Aaron has gone through. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, um, I think we should probably close it out but um y'all have our emails here if you have any other questions since we didn't get to spend a lot of time on questions um and then we will also be getting an email from us uh with a certificate for the mcle and with the powerpoint presentation um thank you all for taking the time to join us in this training um and enjoy the rest of your day thank you bye thank you.